Hey kids, it's Jurassic James, and on Interesting Explains, looking at Helicoprion. So I will start with this cast model of, of, of the fossil. Uh, cool story, these animals first, well, this first of all, they're found all over the world, but particularly in Europe, they would find this thing, and the first assumption, of course, is it's an ammonite. It looks very similar to ammonites. In fact, when I teach kids, I'll hold this cast up and say, what, is this, what do you think this is? And at least one or two kids say, oh, ammonite. And you say, what, what do you mean? Well, I mean, look at this, and look at... You know, like that. It's, it's the same thing, right? It's, yeah. But if you don't know what an ammonite is, uh, just know that they are squid relatives. So you're seeing there's a hard shell right there. And the idea is that the soft parts, the skin, uh, does not fossilize very often. So we only find this part here. But occasionally, in some areas, I think in Germany, you'll find like imprints of that too. But in general, we find this. So when you first find this mysterious fossil, you think it's like that. It's a swirl. But Luckily, in paleontology, we don't just learn about one thing. We learn about all kinds of animals that uh, pass and present. And when looking at the actual structure, they are more like shark's teeth, basically. But no shark's tooth has ever been found like this before. So the question is, if they're shark's teeth, or at least made from shark material or shark-like material, where did it fit on a shark? So one picture shows it like this, where it's coming out of the shark's jaw and spalling around. There's also a shark in the Devonian period that has like two like structures on its dorsal fin, so maybe it was there. Uh, the, the models I have here, oldest to youngest, only the two, uh, is based on recent research and actually fits in the jaw basically like, like this, okay? I'm going to go over more about that in a minute when I'm, I'm talking about the animal with a bigger model, but just know that that's like the mystery solved thanks to a CT scan. And if you know what a CT scan is, it's like an x-ray but really, really intense and really detailed. And the idea is that uh, they took some fossils from Idaho, the, some of the best in the world of found in Idaho, and scanned them there. Now, where does it fit in the story of life? I've often talked about my friends, the Metrodon and the Dothosaurus, the, these Permian animals, why they're li living on land. In the aquatic area, we have Diplocolus, the salamander-like animal, and, sorry, Xenocanthus. And the idea is that these are living in the freshwater too, so at the same time that they're running around on land, we have this guy in the ocean in the Permian period. And it's really fun because I normally focus on terrestrial life, um, not the open ocean in this, in this time. So it's kind of a fun thing to go over. But look at the model. The first model I had came from this guy, this little guy here. And I remember uh, in Safari, so if you go to Michael's Hobby Lobby or online, they have the Safari tubes, you know, like, you know, little ones for fish and for dinosaurs. Well, there's one for prehistoric sharks. So I bought it and there's lots of other prehistoric sharks there. The Xenocanthus is from that, that pack. And the idea is that uh, there are other sharks from this time, or shark-like animals, say shark-like animals. I'm going to explain why with the actual big model. Uh, but the idea is that, uh, you know, it's, it, they're not huge, but they're enough to get the idea across. And I think with many toy companies, when they're not sure how something will sell, they'll get a the smaller version of it and see. And they don't have to make really big ones, which I'm going to go over more on that idea uh, next week with my with the Dragonosaurus. Anyway, so that being said, that's the first guy. Now, this one is a PNSO model, and I told you before, especially in the summer, I have fallen in love with PNSO. They're kind of, they're more expensive than the Safari or Papo, but it's really worth it. So, on the box itself, it's called the name of the animal is Haley, the Helicoprion. They give them names, which I thought was kind of weird, but you know, whatever. So, uh, you open the box like this, and open there, and you pull out this thing here. As an all PNSO, there is a little card or little thing here. And if you open on this side, you have the, the title, uh, the title, the front page, and then like a actual model, and then the data. On the back side, you see it here, and you'll see it's actually a, a poster of the, of, of the thing. I'm gonna say why it's such an important picture to have. In the meantime, take the top layer off of this. And we pull out this really cool thing. This is really great. So, let's see. So looking at the, so the only articulation is the jaw. So it's like right there. It opens up like that. You can see the, the little row of teeth. So we now know that where most sharks, like for example, a, a, a great white, or if in this case for visual, my, my megalodon here. So the teeth are like, like in rows like this. So it goes, one tooth goes out, the other one goes forward. So like basically you have teeth here, one, go, one goes away, that one goes forward, another one like that, right? Uh, it's actually kind of similar to that, only it's one row of teeth. 
So they'll grow a new tooth and push the other forward and forward like that. So it's new tooth, new tooth, new tooth like that. And they go into the spire like this. So uh, the scan also showed that they didn't have any teeth on top. There's no teeth right there. So it kind of fits into the spot. And what's really important about the teeth is that uh, we, we don't see any uh, damage on them. And what I mean is that for a shark, a great white shark, for example, you'll see where we'll find on well, but well, not great white, so on megalodons, we'll find fossil whales with bite marks in their bones. So we know the megalodon's biting into the animal, hitting a bone. Sharks don't want to eat the bones. So the idea is that the, sh that the tooth is getting gouged out or hurt or damaged. And in fact, uh, gray whites do not like diving cages because they go to them, they bite metal, and they break their teeth off, and they regrow their teeth, you know. So the fact that there's no damage on the tooth means you're eating soft prey. So the poster showed earlier, they're eating squid because squid are like rabbits in the ocean. They're really fast. And how do you catch a squid? You just go through, slice it, and then eat it up that way. Uh, if they, they wouldn't have been eating ammonites because they have a hard shell to get through. Even if they were to go here, I mean, I'm not saying it's impossible, but it's less likely they would do that because the hard shell's there. Uh, I believe in the Permian it's before the octopus. So, and again, there may have been other soft-bodied animals or soft-bodied cephalopods in particular that we have not found fossils of. They're not preserved. So we don't know that, but we do think squid was the main thing because there's no sign of damage on the tooth. Now, as far as this guy, and I, I use the word shark very loosely because it's not technically a shark or it's not classified as a shark anymore. Uh, the idea is uh, there's a thing. So the term chondrithes means cartilaginous fish. So osteoithes are bony fish. Those are like the, uh, you know, salmon and tuna and lungfish. When you think cartilaginous fish, you think of sharks. And that is true. Sharks are the most famous and most proliferated version of these animals. But there are other groups too. So people say, well, wait a minute. It's like a placket, like, like a ducalosteus. Ducalosteus is a placoderm. It's another kind of fish. And the idea here is that, in fact, these guys never met because this guy's found in late Devonian rock. And this is found in Permian rock. So there are different time periods as well. They would have never interacted, basically. So what's going on with the, with the crotch fish? What's its most, it's closest relative? Well, despite its appearance in this model, its closest relative would be actually this guy here, the ghost fish. So there's a group of fish, sharks, or sorry, there's a group of cartilaginous fish called ghost fish or ratfish. These guys are essentially, um, uh, they're shark cousins, basically. And recent research has shown that these guys are closer to, the, to them than they are to modern sharks. So how does this work? Here's, I brought an analogy. So everyone here hopefully knows what a cat and a dog are. So I always tell my students, imagine for example, you are talking to an alien and you're trying to tell them the difference between a cat or a dog. And you have to write down the list of or characteristics. We said, well, they're both, they're mammals. They have fur, they walk on four legs. They have whiskers. They can be used as pets. These are all the same terms for both of them. So at some point, you're going to have to look at some kind of skeletal structure, some kind of behavioral thing to say, okay, this is why this is this, right? And that's the way it works in paleontology is that you have to look at the animal and say, well, what list of characteristics differentiate this animal from other animals? And that's not how it works. And whenever I say a kingdom, file, and order, all those terms of biological nomenclature, how we classify animals, the idea is that we're looking at everything I say is is based on a list of stuff. And that's why the video is very, like, here's a 10-minute video. Um, when I do my classes, it's more detail, like, here's how we knew that, basically, right? So, for example, on the, on the same analogy, you have your differentiation of cat and dog. You find a wolf, their features light up more with dog. And you find a lion, they just light up more with cat, right? But then you have a hyena, and hyenas look like dogs, but they're actually closer to cats. Because if you look at the, dy the, the criteria that you made cats in, they are in that branch. And you say, well, why are they dog-like? Well, it's because in Africa where they lived, uh, well, like, well, well, hyenas were uh, you know, also in Asia and in Europe, but uh, they we didn't have hyenas in North America. We had we had uh, dogs in the Miocene that would hunt prey like like hyenas. So what hyenas have done is they are essentially the the cat's version of a dog. And so so what's going on is that you know we have African wild dogs, but they are again the cat version of a dog. So these animals have been defined as one group, and they're defined as one group. And it was in their group, dogs are not wolves, and wolves are not, you know, they're different groups within that group. But overall, that's how it works, okay? So, when looking at Archaeolocoprion, when you find this large set of teeth that are shark-like, you know, it's a shark, right? That's, that's, that's the interpretation. And there's a lot of debates on how and why, but overall, that's it, right? But in Chondrixes, the most famous group, you know, of, are the, you know, think of the Great White, the Megalodon. These are sharks that are really well-known, very impactful in their environment. 
placoderms are not sharks. They're even though they have carl carlish bodies, I believe they have these bony platy heads, and not and sharks don't have bones. So, in walks or well, in swims, not walks. Are kind of, are and oh right, the group that ratfish and uh, ghost fish they all fall under. Those are all their nicknames. Uh, they're also scientific names for them. I have a link to my shark page on on, on the description. So those guys are called chimera. And you think, oh, like Greek mythology? No, 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 like that's similar name, but not the same thing. Uh, the chimera forms are these other kind of carnivorous fish. Another branch of this group, a uh, branch would be the uh, the, the rays and skates. So just like a ray, if you look at a stingray, it looks like a shark that's been like flat pressed into a tortilla, basically. And so the idea here is that sharks are one thing, they're the thing, they're both caused as fish. The chimera are a different kind of animal, right? So they're, they're still shark-like, but they're not like sharks. There's, there's certain differences like the dogs and cats that we define that are making them different, right? So I'm not saying that helicoprion is a chimera, what I'm saying is Helicoprion is closer to Chimeras than it is to rays and to sharks. Actually, I should do it that way. So that's all we're saying here. So if that makes sense to you, I hope it does. If not, put a, ask a question in the, in, the, in the comments. But the idea is that when we define these things, I can see why someone not knowing, oh, it's a shark-like body, right? But the difference there is very simple, that they have more characteristics in line with this group than that group. Which is why even I think, we don't know color, but the paint job is very... Um, different iridescent it's not what we see in many shark models i have a shack behind the camera i have several shark models past and present nothing like this before but it does match how the chimera their closest living relatives look basically and the last analogy on this concept i'll give you is uh humans uh people will say humans closest relative are chimps and that's not true our closest relatives are neanderthals uh, they're so close that we've read with them we have neanderthal people people with neanderthal dna to this day uh then you say, well, chimps are the closest living relatives. Well, actually, no, because the bonobos, or the bonobos, the uh, pygmy chimps, those are closer to humans than, than pan, pan troglodytes, chimp, you know, like that. So it's one of those things, closest living relative, looking at this animal, its closest living relative is the ghost fish, in my, my models, or rat fish, in some other examples. Even though it looks like a shark, it's closer to these guys, too. So that's kind of the big deal with this animal, and that's why it's so cool. And this is, um, like I said, there's only, there's only two that I'm aware of, two models on the market, the tube from Safari and then the PNSO from China. So this is the kind of model that if I'm doing a lecture or a class, I'm bringing this one with me. Um, I don't leave these guys at the, at the museum. I have them at home because, you know, the, you, know the, you don't see there's some here, there's some over there too, some behind the camera. It's a huge room of stuff. But the idea is that this is one that if I'm talking about sharks, I'm going to bring this guy with me because this is a, a beautiful, awesome model. Um, in every way, you know, the gill slits. The... Now, one thing to point out too is we don't know exactly how the body's built because uh, it turns out sharks, or chondrithes, not sharks, shark chondrithes, are made of, well, sharks too, are made of cartilage, therefore, you know, have those parts. But we do often find imprints of these animals or at least some kind of outline. But not this one, but other things. So that's why the body's based on its diet of eating possibly squid, you get to be fast. And I remember my zoology class, there's a whole section on like fish and shark tails. And how the tails can tell you how the animal moves and the speed in the environment. You know, if it's another, you know, think about how a stingray, not stingray, the fish that live like the electric eels, how they live in certain areas like with fresh water, so they have certain kind of fins. Where a great white shark or a mako has a certain kind of fin, they're faster compared to other sharks that have different kind of, you know. So that's why this fin may be based on speculation, but it's at least based on if it's eating squid, it has to be fast, therefore it should have this kind of pattern, right? So even every, so everything in there is even there's something based on some data. Um, I don't have time to go over everything in detail, but that's what I'm trying to show you here is that there's a lot of data driven information going into this toy. And so I give uh, PNSO the like the Jurassic James seal of approval. This is not a commercial. I do not uh, get an endorsement or whatever. I just I'm letting you know the fans of paleontology. This is really awesome. This is a good model. If you buy it, I would suggest it. That being said, thank you for tuning in. I'll see you guys next week. We're going to do Dread Now the Source. Uh, I'm going to do an unboxing for the Jurassic World figure. And um, if you have any questions or comments, please send them below.